Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. It is with great pleasure that I introduce you to Avital Barnea. Uh, she's the Deputy Secretary for Transportation Planning at the California State Transportation Agency, or CALSTA, where she provides advisory focusing on transportation planning, sustainability programs, mass transit, rail, ports, and freight. She's an expert in public affairs and urban and regional planning. And before joining CALSTA, she was the program manager for freight at ASHTO. And before that, she worked for the Office of the Secretary at the US DOT and the Federal Transit Administration. Before, as a presidential management fellow, she served on Capitol Hill during the passage of MAP 21. So that's very cool. And she also has some experiences in public transit in Minnesota, or Minneapolis, sorry. <laughs> uh, today, she will provide us with an overview of the freight transportation system in general, and California in particular. Avital, thank you so much, and we are all yours. Great. Thank you, Dr. Heyer. My name is Avital Barnea, and it's a pleasure to be able to join you today by video conference. Um, as Dr. Hayer said, I'll be speaking to you about California and the state of freight, including an overview of current freight trends and discussion of our state's role in the national and international freight sector. Before we delve into the subject matter of my presentation, I'd like to give you a little background on the California State Transportation Agency. As our name implies, we are a state level agency and we're located in Sacramento. CalSTA was created in 2013 to be an umbrella over the state's transportation functions. And that includes the DOT, otherwise known as Caltrans, the Department of Motor Vehicles, the High Speed Rail Authority, the California Highway Patrol, the California Transportation Commission, the Board of Pilot Commissioners, the Office of Traffic Safety, and the new Motor Vehicle Board. As an agency, we help to make sure the transportation functions in the state are coordinated. We are led by Secretary David Kim, who reports directly to Governor Gavin Newsom. Our agency is very small, actually. We only have 25 employees, but within the eight departments and commissions that make up the CalSTA family, there are over 40,000 employees throughout the state. If any students are interested in uh, working at CalSTA, you should look into the Capital Fellows Program. This is a program that places recent college graduates in executive fellowships at some of the highest levels of California state government, where you assist with a broad range of public policy issues. CalSTA is fortunate to have an executive fellow on staff this year. Her name is Natalie Fowler, and she will actually be starting law school at UC Davis this fall. In addition, I just wanna take a moment to encourage students, especially those of you who may be worried about entering the workforce during recession, that there are other resources available to you to help you grow in your career. I also graduated during a recession, uh, during the 2008 recession, and um, I understand what that's like. I was fortunate to get a job through another fellowship program, as Miguel uh, mentioned, the Presidential Management Fellowship, and I would encourage you to look into that program if you are interested in working at the federal level. In addition, uh, starting as a graduate student, I became active in professional organizations such as the Women's Transportation Seminar, the American Planning Association, and other professional groups that were invaluable to my career advancement. So regardless of your employment status or where you are in your education, I would highly recommend that you get involved with a professional organization that caters to your interests. And that would be a way to bolster your career, your network, and your professional skills. Okay, so back to the main content of today's presentation. So what exactly is freight? When we talk about transportation, I found that many people tend to think about transportation in terms of the movement of people such as public transportation, automobiles, bicycles, and pedestrian transportation, commercial air travel, et cetera. However, the movement of goods also comprises a significant and often overlooked aspect of the transportation sector. Before we all had to start worrying about when the next toilet paper, toilet paper or disinfecting wipes shipment would come into the store or be made available on Amazon, 
I found that most people, including many transportation professionals, had not given a lot of thought to freight. To further confirm my assertion that freight is often overlooked, just go to the Wikipedia article on freight transport and you will see that it is pitifully short. Anyway, to set the stage, I wanna give you a basic definition of freight. Freight is any cargo such as produce, automobiles, chemicals, petroleum, furniture, apparel, electronics, fertilizer, and yes, even toilet paper that you use or consume as part of your everyday life or the raw materials to make those products. In simpler terms, freight is the transport of stuff rather than the transport of people. The transport of freight occurs along a complex network of different modes of transportation with goods traveling anywhere from just a few miles domestically to thousands of miles internationally. Freight transportation occurs by air and airplane or drone, over water by ship or barge, and overland by truck, railroad, pipeline, bicycle, robot, or other means. Freight may travel on these modes in shipping containers, as liquid or dry bulk, or by quote unquote, rolling on and rolling off the conveyor, such as with automobiles. Often a single shipment of freight will move across multiple modes of transportation before reaching its destination. For example, let's follow the flow of a good that is in high demand right now, hand sanitizer. This chart shows how first, corn is harvested in Illinois and then delivered by truck to the nearest mill. The corn is then refined and combined with yeast to produce an ethanol product. The ethanol is then moved by rail to a manufacturing facility in Ohio, which upon arrival is combined with other ingredients to produce hand sanitizer. It is then bottled, packaged, and picked up again by truck to be brought to your nearest retailer or public facility. Throughout each of these movements, truck, rail, truck, the product is being transported as freight. This is just one example, but when you think about all of the goods moving through the freight network, I hope you see that freight is a critical component of the transportation system and that it significantly contributes to the economy and our quality of life. Within the United States, we have an extensive freight transportation network Goods in our country move across 958,000 miles of highways, 141,000 miles of railroads, 11,000 miles of inland waterways, and 1.6 million miles of pipelines. In addition, the U.S. has more than 19,000 airports and more than 5,000 coastal, Great Lakes, and inland waterway facilities that comprise the freight network. <clears throat> Domestically, trucks move the largest share of freight by tonnage, followed by rail, then pipeline, and finally air. Air transportation is a relatively minor mode for domestic shipments because it is expensive to ship goods by air. I also wanna mention that although this slide focuses on domestic freight, when we look at international shipments to and from the United States, by far the largest share, about 75% of all goods by tonnage, arrive or depart by ship. Weight is only part of the story when it comes to freight transportation, however. The other critical components are the value of goods and the distance shipped. For example, while rail carries 10% of domestic freight measured in tons, rail transports only 4% of freight by value, reflecting the fact that rail cargoes, such as coal and grain, have low ratios of value to weight. Furthermore, even though trucks move a higher share of freight by ton and value, the average truck shipment travels a much shorter distance than the average rail shipment. Typically, trucks carry high value, time-sensitive freight like livestock or electronics. Rail and barge tends to carry lower value, higher tonnage, and less time-sensitive goods over longer distances. As I mentioned on the previous slide, Freight shipment by air is quite expensive, so only the highest value, most urgent shipments tend to go by air, 
such as gemstones and pharmaceuticals. Of note, California has the second highest share of freight shipments in the country, both in terms of weight and value. The only state that has more freight shipments is Texas. Looking more closely at California, as a state with nearly 40 million people and the fifth largest economy in the world, we are a major player in the freight transportation network. In fact, California has the most extensive, least polluting, highest capacity, and most technically advanced multimodal freight transportation system in the United States. California's freight system connects it to the rest of the country through several multimodal corridors that provide access to every state in the nation, as well as international gateways that connect our state to trading partners in other countries. The state's freight system is comprised of 12 seaports, numerous private port and terminal facilities, 12 airports with major cargo operations, two class one railroads and 27 short line railroads that operate over 6,500 miles of railroad track. We have approximately 5,800 miles of high traffic volume interstate and state highways, seven land border ports of entry with Mexico, intermodal transfer facilities, approximately 19,000 miles of hazardous liquid and natural gas pipelines, a vast warehousing and distribution sector, and numerous local connector roads that comprise the last mile. Furthermore, California also has robust international trading, which is a pillar of the state's economy. This chart shows where goods imported to California came from in 2018. And in addition, in that year, California exported goods, including automobiles, fruit, nuts, other food products, chemicals, metals, and more, to 230 foreign markets valued at approximately $178 billion. As we look to the future and anticipate the growth of freight, truck flows are in turn projected to grow. As you can see from this map, California will continue to play a huge role in the distribution of goods throughout the country and the world, with trucks bringing goods into and out of California's seaports and major urban areas over the next two decades. We are very much planning for the future of freight at CalSTA, including strengthening California's existing freight system while making strategic improvements to increase mobility and safety, while also protecting communities and the environment. One of the ways that we are doing this is through an update to California's freight mobility plan. The California Freight Mobility Plan 2020 is a comprehensive plan for immediate and long range statewide multimodal freight activities and investments. This document provides a vision for freight across the state and covers current freight conditions as well as future trends, issues, and challenges. The plan identifies seven goals as shown on this slide to enhance economic vitality, environmental stewardship, and social equity, through the freight system in order to keep California as the national leader in freight. We released a draft update to this plan in January and hope to release the final plan this month. So now that we've discussed some of the basics of freight, I'd like to get into some of the many trends that are affecting the industry. You can see here that a variety of external factors influence goods movement, such as technology, environmental considerations, economic factors, politics, and social aspects. This includes trends such as changing consumer demand, urbanization, advanced technologies, and trade agreements, which I will get into as we go through the presentation. A little later, I will also talk about the effects of COVID-19 on freight, just to give you a preview of what is coming up. For the past several decades, our economy has been globalizing at an increasing rate. International imports and exports are primarily transported by ship, and those ships have been getting larger and larger over time. 
The graphic on the left shows how the size of ocean freight liners has increased drastically over just the past few years. This is also thanks in part to the widening of the Panama Canal, which can now accommodate larger ships traveling between the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. I want to point out that this chart is a little outdated, so I put a graphic in the lower right corner that shows the largest container ship, which can carry 23,000 756 TEUs. Um, a TEU is another name for a container. And that ship is as long as four football, excuse me, four football fields. Once the goods are unloaded from these so-called mega ships, freight traveling far distances will then be placed on rail cars. Using the MSC Golson, which is our mega ship here, as an example, it's over 23,000 containers if stacked end to end would stretch nearly 70 miles long. Of course, not all of the containers will be placed on rail cars, some will be placed on trucks, but you can see how the phenomenon of larger ships would also lead to the need for longer trains. It is more operationally and cost efficient for railroads to run longer trains than shorter ones. And over the past couple years, trains have grown to be up to three miles long. There are pros and cons to this. Running longer trains brings down the overall cost of the goods. However, communities have been crying foul in recent years as trains occupy or block at grade crossings for much longer periods of time, leading to decreases in quality of life and perhaps even safety issues for the people stuck waiting for the trains to pass. Another big trend in the freight sector are changes to the so-called last mile of delivery. At the top left is a picture of how we all primarily did our shopping 10 years ago by going to the store. Supply chains were set up to bring goods to these specific locations with trucks making daily deliveries to variety uh, of a variety of merchandise to one end destination. However, with the growing volume of e-commerce, the last mile is changing and adapting to customer preference. Sure, we may still go to Target to pick up items that we need, but many consumers are finding it more convenient for the goods to be brought to them instead. New methods of last mile delivery now include neighborhood package lockers, curbside pickup, having items delivered to the trunk of your car. Oops, excuse me, lost my notes here for a sec. Um, delivery to your doorstep in a matter of hours, or packages simply dropped off at your doorstep or delivered to a package room in a multi-unit building. These advancements in last mile delivery have upended the supply chain. Instead of primary, primarily delivering a large supply of inventory to a brick and mortar store, carriers are now making many small deliveries to multiple destinations. This has made the modern supply chain tremendously complex and also increased costs for shippers as last mile delivery often makes up half of all logistical costs, according to the American Transportation Research Institute. Despite the increased cost of last mile delivery, consumers expect that products will be delivered to them at little to no additional cost and in much shorter delivery windows. In response, business models that once revolved around centralized distribution networks and brick and mortar stores are evolving to meet these new customer demands. But before the goods make it to your door or to the shelves at the store, they are stored in warehouses and fulfillment centers waiting to be brought that last mile. Warehouses and fulfillment centers are part of a hub and spoke model where products that land in ports are then shipped to large regional warehouses that act as a storage facility and intermediary between the various links in the supply chain. From there, the products can be shipped to smaller fulfillment centers by truck, air, or rail. At fulfillment centers, functions such as sorting, picking and packing, labeling, assembly, and wrapping of goods occur before shipment. The products then either go to individual stores via retail store truck fleets 
or are delivered directly cons to consumers by carriers such as FedEx, UPS, DHL, and others. Given the change to last mile delivery, the complexity and prevalence of warehouses and fulfillment centers has increased. One way retailers are addressing that last mile is by opening new warehouses or fulfillment centers that are closer to their customers or leveraging existing retail stores to fulfill online orders. Sites that are closer to the consumer improve the speed of delivery while also lowering the cost of shipping. Unlike traditional brick and mortar stores, which are best located in places with heavy foot traffic, the most desirable locations for warehouses are near urban population centers uh, that have a million, excuse me, a minimum of 1 million square feet of land available for development and have good access to the freight transportation network. Conversely, fulfillment centers are typically smaller warehouses between 50,000 and 500,000 square feet and are located in urban areas, not just adjacent to them. In some cases, smaller facilities in urban industrial zones are being repurposed as fulfillment centers, and in other cases, retailers are using their brick and mortar stores to fulfill orders. For example, companies such as Amazon rely on a network of local fulfillment centers to respond to same day, next day, and two day delivery, whereas a company like Walmart uses their retail stores as fulfillment centers. California has certainly experienced this trend in increases in warehouses and fulfillment centers. In fact, Southern California is home to one of the largest clusters of these types of facilities in all of North America. We have approximately 34,000 warehouses and fulfillment centers in Southern California that occupy over 1 billion square feet of land. While the majority of California's warehousing activities occur in the Los Angeles region, Significant facilities exist in other parts of the state as well, including near the California-Mexico border, in the Inland Empire, and in the northern San Joaquin Valley. In particular, San Bernardino and Riverside counties, Bakersfield and Stockton have all seen significant rise of industrial warehouse development in recent years. Additionally, Amazon currently has 19 fulfillment centers operating throughout the state. Another point I want to mention is that warehousing relies on efficient goods movement to ensure the warehouse capacity is neither overfilled nor empty. But this has been a challenge, partly in response to the U.S.-China trade war. In late 2018, goods started flowing into U.S. seaports in, a, in an attempt to beat new tariffs with China. This surge in imports led to an influx of goods that would not be needed right away and instead have been shelved in warehouses for exceptionally long periods of time. In addition, the strong economy led to a historically low warehouse vacancy rate. For example, during the economic downturn of 2008 to 2009, warehouse vacancy rates in California were around 9 to 10%, but this year, warehouse vacancy rates are 4% or less in Northern California and near 0% in Southern California, where very few warehouses remain unleased. This has resulted in a situation where nearly all warehouse space in California is leased, and nearly all of those warehouses are filled to capacity. Advancements in the freight sector are not just limited to the location of storage facilities, though, uh, they also affect the vehicles that deliver goods as well. Emerging technologies are being used to transport freight, including autonomous trucks, truck platooning, and delivery by drone or robot. You're probably familiar with autonomous vehicles, which have autopilot functions that require little or no human input. Autonomous trucks can either have a safety driver in the cab or be supported by remote operation as you see in the top middle picture. A related technology is truck platooning, where two or more trucks travel closely together in a convoy using connected technology to regulate acceleration and braking. Truck platooning can reduce fuel consumption and emissions and improve safety. For much smaller and mo more local deliveries, 
drones and sidewalk robots are being tested in certain markets to bring items such as food, lightweight goods, and even human organs directly to the consumer. In addition to autonomous trucks, drones, and sidewalk robots, marine terminals at seaports are also employing automation. This is a video I took at the Long Beach Container Terminal. I hope it's not too choppy for you, but in the foreground is an automated internal transport vehicle that is carrying a container. And in the background, you can see an automated straddle carrier. These technologies can potentially move more goods while generating fewer emissions than traditional manned marine terminals. Yet even with these new technologies, the freight sector has also been turning to some older modes as well. In dense urban areas, carriers are solving the challenge of last mile delivery through smaller vehicles or conveyances powered by active transportation. The top left picture shows USPS mail delivery by Porter in New York City. The middle picture is package delivery by bike in Copenhagen. And on the right is UPS's electric cargo delivery trike in use in Pittsburgh. The rise in e-commerce and package delivery has led to an increasing number of trucks and vehicles on the road, which in turn leads to more congestion and may even impact the speed of delivery for customers who expect their packages to arrive on demand. Conversely, delivery on foot or by bike has a lot of benefits, including reducing traffic congestion, eliminating the need to find parking, more easily maneuvering around dense urban areas, and reducing environmental impact. The last trend in freight, or maybe I should say disruption, uh, that I want to mention is COVID-19, which of course has brought challenges to nearly every facet of life. Truck shipments to grocery and discount stores are soaring during the pandemic, growing at more than 50% compared to the same time last year as retailers rushed to restock depleted shelves. Other shipping customers, especially retailers and restaurants, have essentially shut down nationwide. With the restaurants closed, truck drivers were finding that they had few options for a hot meal while they were on the road. They were also having trouble obtaining a sufficient supply of personal protective equipment, such as masks and hand sanitizer. In response, CalSTA and the state have taken several steps to respond to the emergency and assist the freight industry. In April, Governor Newsom signed an executive order temporarily eliminating restrictions on commercial food vending at Caltrans rest areas so truckers can find food at a time when several restaurants are shut down. As of yesterday, 18 private food trucks were operating at public rest areas across the state, providing a variety of food truck options to truck drivers and others who must be on the road during this time. In addition, California's ports have remained fully operational, although they are facing reductions in imported cargo as manufacturing in China has slowed due to the virus and demand for goods has declined. CalSTA is in frequent communication with the ports to monitor terminal operations, workforce health and safety, cargo volumes, and movement of essential commodities and supplies. For example, we develop policy options to address warehousing issues at ports that had, begun, that had become cluttered with containers filled with consumer imports, such as automobiles, furniture, and other merchandise that people essentially stopped buying during the pandemic. And last week, the California Highway Patrol started distributing masks to truck drivers at 10 locations across the state, as you can see in that upper right hand picture. The silver lining for, for truck drivers during the pandemic is that with most people staying home, they are having to contend with very little traffic. For example, last month in Los Angeles, which is of course infamous for its roadway congestion, congestion excuse me, trucks averaged 53 miles per hour on the interstate during the morning rush hour, which is over twice their usual speed at that time of day. 
At CalSTA, we are continuing to monitor freight and all transportation throughout the state during the COVID-19 emergency. And we are committed to doing our part to ensure that both freight and passenger transportation remain operational as the essential services that they are. Uh, so with that, thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions about freight, what we're doing at the state, navigating a career in transportation, or anything else you would like to ask. Thank you, Abital. We have a question uh, on the chat, and is how does the freight mobility plan address the problem of air pollution in communities in close proximity to shipping facilities? Yeah. Um, so we have targets in the state. This is mainly uh, led by the California Air Resources Board, but there are targets to uh, certainly bring down emissions, increase the number of uh, zero emission electric trucks on the road, and we are very cognizant of that. Um, there is also the California Sustainable Freight Action Plan, which came out a couple years ago and has very much informed the California Freight Mobility Plan. and um, something else we're really cognizant of is that the communities near these uh, freight um, hubs tend to be uh, lower income minority communities that uh, are facing the brunt of things like air pollution and noise pollution. And so we are very much focusing on the equity as well of um, making sure that freight is still an economic driver in the state, but not adversely impacting those communities. I don't see any hands. Any questions for Arital? Okay, so I'll, I'll start my question. Okay, so we have Carlos. Carlos, go ahead. So you mentioned the electric bikes have a really good alternative for the last mile and we know that there are some barriers to the implementation of this technology in the last mile, but since you are working more directly with these agencies, how, but how likely will be to have these technologies like soon on the streets in California? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, these technologies already are being deployed in certain markets, like you saw on my slide a couple slides back. These are all real life examples happening today. Um, you know, I think it often depends on the, um, the layout of communities where these deliveries are being made, if they have bike lanes or sidewalks, um, if there are any policies that would restrict these kinds of deliveries. But usually in these kinds of situations, the technology is ahead of the policy. And so I don't think that we're waiting on the technology necessarily. I think that that already exists. It's just a matter of deploying these options in communities where it would be helpful. Thank you. Sure. Tisora. Hi, Miguel. Hi, Avital. Uh, so question regarding uh, the Department of Transportation uh, Smart Cities Challenge that I think a few years back, the department um, asked for proposals from certain cities. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess we were back reading through some of the proposals from cities. Uh, about a good share of the proposals had, uh, they were thinking about freight and how to support logistics hubs, uh, more seamless means of transport through cities, and how do you design infrastructure for, like smart infrastructure for freight and all. I'm curious, um, in reality, when you do planning, seamless um, sort of multimodal planning, for freight or in California, um, is it a serious discussion? Do you think of smart cities, smart infrastructure as a thing that comes into the future? Or is it feasible from like a business plan perspective? Is it a feasible thing? Thanks. Yeah, um, we're definitely thinking about it. Um, we wanna make sure that these technologies are rolled out safely and in a coordinated manner. And so um, as I mentioned to the last uh, questioner that you know the technology exists it's just making sure that it can be deployed in a way that makes sense um, I see our job in the government as being uh, as keeping an eye out for the people and for the common good and 
uh, the private sector often has great ideas, but they have their best interest in mind um, a lot of the time. And so we want to make sure that any of these technologies that are being rolled out impact people equitably and safely. Um, so we're very much thinking about automation, about um, the Internet of Things, connected technologies, all of that. Um, and let's see, I was going to say something else. I'm losing my train of thought a little bit on that. Um, but yes, we're definitely we're definitely um, thinking about it, working on it. And if I remember what I was going to say a minute ago, I will um, chime in with that again. Okay, I have a couple of questions from the chat. Uh, the first one is, uh, what have the agency or other agencies that you that you're involved with uh, been thinking about? on how to contend with the potential impacts on the job market uh, with the advent of autonomous uh, vehicles and autonomous technology, especially in freight. Great, thank you. Yeah, and that actually reminds me of what I was going to say. Um, autonomous vehicles are here and Google has their autonomous car, Uber. Um, you know, there are a lot of autonomous vehicles that have been developed. Um, we are very cognizant, especially now, of the job loss that could potentially occur from those technologies. Um, there will of course still be jobs needed to operate autonomous vehicles. Um, for example, the video I showed you of the automated uh, terminal at, at Long Beach, there are people that are in an offsite control room basically that have all these computer screens and like little joysticks and they can intervene if needed in those operations. But when I went in there, there were maybe four people operating dozens of pieces of container equipment. So it, it's, uh, it's fewer jobs and it's different job skills. And so there will be a period where we need to retrain the workforce to move from, for example, being a, an Uber driver or a truck driver to um, you know, working more on the technology of those um, types of transportation. Um, so, that's a, a big thing that we're thinking about in regards to automation. Um, we're also concerned about what effects automation can have on land use. Um, you know, we have pretty poor air quality in the state of California, and that's largely attributed to the transportation sector. At least 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions in California come from transportation, and that's just looking at tailpipe emissions. That's not looking at the creation of any of the fuel that goes into those vehicles. Um, so uh, we want to make sure that with autonomous vehicles that um, we're not inducing sprawl, that um, you know, we're not impacting people that may choose not to be in cars, whether they're on foot or bike. Um, you know, there are certainly going to be huge safety benefits from autonomous vehicles, um, emissions benefits. We're envisioning that autonomous vehicles will be all electric, but um, we're certainly taking that into account and including that in the California Freight Mobility Plan and in other documents that the state is producing and policies. Thank you. I have another question that I will tie in with um, a general question. As part of the class, we have been, as part of my class, we have been uh, working on uh, freight plans and especially looking into MPO freight plans and comparing them to state freight plans and so on. So I, I wanted to, to ask you about the Calsta mobility plan and how much emphasis are you paying to kind of the last mile aspect of freight as opposed to kind of more the strategic corridor, large volumes and containerized traffic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think it depends. Um, so on the one hand, um, the last mile tends to be more of a local issue and, and we're focusing very much on statewide policies and, and projects, but um, the last mile is a huge part of the freight network, as you know. Um, so we certainly you know, talk about the last mile, a lot of the content that I presented to you in this presentation came from the California Freight Mobility Plan 2020, the draft that we released in January. Um, so last mile is a, a big consideration. Um, 
The other thing is that um, the state and government in general tends to be very slow moving. And I mean, that's by design, I think, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, but that has led to a pipeline of projects that are ready to go that don't necessarily reflect the latest trends in, in the freight sector. So we're trying to advance more projects that meet current needs, that uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and vehicle miles traveled, that move freight onto more multimodal uh, modes. Um, and uh, the last mile is certainly part of the thinking of that, but sometimes our project list that has been developed throughout the state for the last several years is maybe a little bit lagging in that regard. Okay, so continue with that. Now the question that is in the chat is about what policies are in place or what are thinking related to how to regulate drones, uh, delivery robots, and all of those new technologies that are kind of more on the local level, but they, they can play a role in the big network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it is true that a lot of that occurs at the local level, but at the state level, you know, we would certainly be interested in the safety of those kinds of technologies, um, perhaps in in registration, I know at the federal level, you you are supposed to register your drone, and so they know you know who who's operating it. Um, so those are the kinds of things that um, we would also be looking at at the state level. Um, and and we don't want to inhibit these new technologies, but again, we just want to make sure that they're rolled out safely and in a coordinated manner. Okay, another question from the chat. Uh, what are the challenges around electrifying trucks and other freight transport technologies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, initially there were challenges in how much capacity the trucks could pull, how much weight and uh, what distances they could go. We still need to install a lot more charging infrastructure in the state and the rest of the country. I mean, a lot of state operates within California, a lot of freight operates within the state of California, um, but it also goes out of the state. And I think that charging infrastructure is even less prevalent in other states than it is here. Um, we've also heard from truck uh, owners and operators that um, in order to meet their emission targets for their trucks, they can't sell their trucks here in California. So if their trucks are too polluting, there is no market for them. And so they have to go to Arizona or Utah or a neighboring state to sell their trucks or the trucks are just junked. Um, and, you know, we can only impact California here. We can't make policies for Utah or Arizona, but we're all breathing the same air. And so, you know, I think locally it does help absolutely to, to have cleaner trucks here, but sometimes those emissions are just being pushed off to other places since the, uh, the more polluting trucks are being sold to those neighboring states. Okay. Any questions? Okay. While well, somebody raises the hand, um, you mentioned the, the short term impact that COVID has had on the freight system and, and the transportation system in general. So, something that we have been working on before is how e commerce is affecting the retail and wholesale. Uh, industry. And I think COVID has evidence uh, or have shown what happens when, when you get retail out of the picture and how the freight had to, to, to change or, or to increase its capacity to deliver more at the resident level. Uh, what have been the considerations uh, to update any of the mobility plans given that uh, retail is going to go into the decline? I mean, that's kind of the evidence. But now with accelerated COVID, we may have some sort of negative cascading effect. Will yeah. uh, anything change? What, what do you anticipate in, in that regard? Yeah, um, you know, I, J. Crew declared bankruptcy, Neiman Marcus is closing at Arden Fair Mall in Sacramento. So there are a lot of retailers that are hurting and were hurting before the pandemic. And I think we're really just seeing an exacer exacerbated level of store bankruptcies and closings because of this. Um, that's related a little bit to the point I mentioned where, um, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, 
the ports were still getting deliveries because these ships had been at sea for weeks. So ships were still coming in with merchandise, but all of the stores were closed and they weren't able to accept that merchandise. And so goods were starting to pile up in um, certain sectors like furniture stores, automobiles that I mentioned, um, the port of Wainimi in Southern California imports a lot of automobiles from Europe and they ran out of space at their port. They had to start storing those new cars at the CSU Channel Islands campus. The school was closed and they have a lot of parking lots and so that's where all those new cars went um, because car dealerships were closed and um, car rental agencies weren't taking delivery of new cars either. Um, now that stores are starting to open up a little bit, that problem has been alleviated, but I think we're still going to see an issue with some freight that just gets abandoned because retailers don't ever open back up or there's a total change in demand. Um, we've also been looking at the distribution of food, um, working with the California Department of Agriculture. Um, we have a lot of dairy cows in California, a lot of fruit, obviously. And you may have seen in the news that um, milk is having to be dumped in some cases. And there is certainly a huge demand for food. People are grocery shopping more than they ever used to. But where the uh, problem comes in is that a lot of this food is packaged in quantities that are not suitable for the grocery store or for the individual consumer. Um, for example, there are 40 pound blocks of cheese that are produced in California and brought to restaurants. And I don't think that any individual consumer necessarily wants 40 pounds of cheese or has a place to store 40 pounds of cheese. Um, and furthermore, the supply chains just aren't set up to bring that food from, you know, say it usually goes to maybe a distributor like Cisco that brings the food to cafeterias or to restaurants that the supply chains aren't set up to bring that food now to grocery stores and grocery stores also don't have space to store that food um, you know with going back to milk um, with schools being closed um, schools often get half pint size milk cartons and grocery stores just don't really sell those um, there's also just a lack of cold storage right now um, with restaurants and cafeterias being closed there just aren't refrigerators to keep all of this stuff. And so it's a big imbalance in the supply chain right now, especially with food. Okay, we have uh, this word again. Thanks, Miguel. Thanks, Arita. So I have a question about, um, I think there's a lot of discussion and sort of a lot of talk that in a post COVID world, that there should be more diversity in supply chains, like international supply chains and logistics, and that, um, I guess, more political discussion in Washington that we should diversify and not depend on one or two or a few countries for supply chains. I'm curious if such in, in such a situation and potentially if, um, if the state of California has uh, international imports coming from more and more countries than it is today. I'm curious when handling with um, products and supply chains coming from different, different countries, um, will it be more challenging, I don't know, in handling products originating from different countries with different regulations, different standards? I guess when you, and in the past few years, when you have uh, logistics and shipments coming from China or Japan, I'm sure there's been a lot of learning and standardization over the years, would it be challenging if things change and more diversity comes in in the future? Thanks. Sure, I'll go back to the slide on international trading. Um, well, we are talking about, you know, if we can support onshore or nearshore manufacturing. Um, as you can see here in California, we get almost half of our imports from China. And China, of course, is where the coronavirus um, started. And China started shutting down a lot of their manufacturing and that's led to a lot of the shortages that you see, like we still can't get disinfecting wipes in the store, you know, um, some other products, masks, you know, that are, are made overseas. Um, and we just didn't have the domestic supply chain 
creating uh, those projects here products here in the US. So something that we've been talking about is, you know, how to support policies to bring manufacturing back to the US or at least closer to the US or to diversify it to more countries. That's a huge question that we absolutely don't have sole jurisdiction over, but it's something that we've certainly been talking about. Um, but manufacturing is starting to come back online in China and we are expecting shipment of more goods over the next couple months. It's still going to be, there's still going to be a dip in imports probably for the next month or two. But after that, we're expecting things to come back online a little bit more. Um, Europe is starting to reopen some of their manufacturing as well with automobiles. Um, in the US, just sort of related to that point, a lot of auto manufacturers you may have heard aren't making cars anymore, they're making ventilators. And so that's certainly disrupting um, the supply chain and the economy. Um, but uh, the ports and the freight sector are being very conscientious about hygiene and providing personal protective equipment to their workers. Um, at the state, we have a very large supply of masks and we did a survey of uh, freight stakeholders, public transportation stakeholders, and a, a variety of other stakeholders around the state to see what kind of masks they need. We asked if they needed N95 masks, cloth masks, disposable masks, and how many and how to get them those masks. And we've already started shipping those out. Um, so we're helping in that way, but a lot of um, ports in particular have been able to obtain their own PPE at this time. They have, um, they have wipes, they have spray, they have masks. Um, the Port of Los Angeles and Jean Soroka, who is the CEO of that port you saw on, on one of my last slides, he's also the head of the um, Los Angeles Logistics. I can't remember, there's a V in there. Their acronym is Love LA, but they are providing PPE to um, a variety of, the, of uh, companies and organizations that need it throughout Southern California. And so they've really made, you know, keeping, keeping safety and hygiene a priority. Um, they're also, I'm hearing, not letting the crews off any of the ships that come in from other countries. They have to stay on the ship. They can't come on land in order to help um, contain the spread of the virus. Thank you. We have a question from Mike. Uh, to what degree does CALSTA work with the federal government on freight policy? Is the federal role primarily providing funding to states? Yeah. Um, so, for example, uh, California was actually a little bit ahead of the federal government, I think, in freight policy. So, California developed its own freight mobility plan, the first plan, in 2014. And... Um, we just did that because we thought it was a good idea. Um, as you have learned in this presentation, freight is a huge sector of the economy here in California. And so we thought it was important to include that as a planning product. Um, the next year in 2015, uh, the FAST Act was passed at the federal level and that mandated that states have freight plans. So California had already done that, um, but the FAST Act had a few new requirements that the California Freight Mobility Plan from 2014 didn't include, um, such as having a, a list of projects, um, having a freight advisory committee, and um, some other um, requirements. And so California updated its freight plan in response to the FAST Act, and now we have updated it again. So the plans are in compliance with the federal requirements. And you're right that if we weren't in compliance with those federal requirements that we would lose out on funding. And so we certainly don't want that. Um, the federal government also designates uh, primary freight corridors and we are responsible for uh, reporting to them, you know, what our freight volumes are and what those corridors are um, in order to, you know, make sure that those primary freight networks are accurate. Another question uh, from Daniel, and I don't know what the extent to the mission of CALSTA is, but the question is about the role of CALSTA uh, in food security. How are you working with food supply chains to 
to, to maintain the pipeline on, on food supply. If you're working with NGOs or any other type of organizations, such as food banks, uh, to bring uh, goods to people that need it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've been coordinating closely with the Department of Agriculture. We've been trying to see if it's possible to perhaps use uh, unused transit buses right now. So, some transit agencies in the state have been reducing service uh, based on reduced demand and reduced revenue. We've been looking into if it's possible to perhaps use those vehicles to transport food. Um, we did issue a clarifying memo that uh, recipients of federal funding that comes through the state to operate paratransit, that's uh, transportation for people with limited mobility, that as long as they're not reducing service to their riders, that they can deliver meals to people. And um, we've also been working with the California Department on Aging. Um, they reached out to us and said, you know, we have people that are stuck in their homes or they're afraid to go to the store because they're vulnerable populations. How can we get food to them? And they were really pleased to receive this clarifying guidance that paratransit providers can provide food to people in need and they have been doing that. So that's a great thing. I'll also just mention, I mentioned unused transit buses. Um, we've also been working to deploy buses here in Sacramento. We've been working with SACRT to bring those buses to locations around the city to provide Wi-Fi to people, um, especially to students who may be having to attend school from home, which um, is impossible if you don't have Wi-Fi. And so these buses are stationed in certain neighborhoods for several hours throughout the day, um, providing free Wi-Fi to people in those communities. Katrina? Hi. Um, so, you know, thanks for E coming out to join us. Um, I was just kind of curious, like, what do you do? Like on a daily basis, like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm doing a lot of uh, reviewing of documents. Um, I am in a lot of meetings. I'm meeting with people. Um, I'm new to California. I just moved here last summer and I'd never lived in California before. I've lived all over the state and other, or excuse me, all over the country and other states, um, but never here. So a lot of my job so far has been relationship building. Um, a lot of things have changed since coronavirus. Um, I spend a significant portion of my time on the phone with um, our modal partners, with the California Association of Port Authorities, the California Transit Association, the Trucking Association, um, and a variety of other stakeholders, just you know, hearing from them what their needs are, and then if there's something we can do at the state to help, I'm um, you know, drafting policy papers, sending emails, trying to figure out who does what and who can help with what. Um, I mean, I think a lot of my job is, is trying to figure out um, how things are working and, and like what's really happening on the ground and um, how we can help and who the right people are to help. So yeah, it's a lot of coordination, a lot of um, talking and meeting with people. That kind of thing. I, I have a lot of autonomy also in my work, which is nice. Um, so I can, you know, meet with who I want to meet with and kind of set my own schedule. I was doing a lot of travel before things shut down to meet with people in person and, and see things in person. Um, so that's kind of a snapshot of what I do on a day to day basis. Awesome. Thank you. So you're just, you're trying to talk to people, just a little bit of everything, it sounds like, which is pretty fun. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're welcome. I, I spend a lot of time sitting in front of my computer, too, I'm not going to lie. Um, so it is nice to be able to get out and see people face to face. Um, but yeah, a lot, a lot of computer time. Have you found anything that is positive about this COVID experience? Anything that you think that, oh, if this didn't happen, we have never found that we were able to do this or that, or we found stuff that didn't work and now we, we can move forward. Has, mm -hmm. Is there any 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 silver lining about, about COVID? Yeah. yeah, I am just an unabashed optimist in, in general, and so it's hard for me not to see the silver lining in, in anything, but um, 
you know, a lot of people are talking about how blue the sky is, how clear the air is, they can hear the birds, they can smell the flowers. And, you know, I think a lot of that is because of transportation has shut down, you know, there's fewer emissions and fewer noise pollution coming from transportation. And of course, that also has terrible implications to what it's doing to the economy. But, um, you know, people are getting outside more, people are walking and biking. Um, several communities have closed roads to traffic to provide more space for people walking and biking. Like Oakland closed, I believe, 74 miles of roads to, to traffic. Um, so I'm really hopeful that people uh, maintain some of these habits, um, you know, that, that um, you know, people continue walking and biking. I think also we have learned a lot about telework during the pandemic. And, um, you know, a lot of businesses are still functioning pretty much as normal with people working from home. And so I think that that is going to be a big trend that we continue to see. And quite frankly, that's going to be huge for reducing congestion and reducing air quality emissions in the state of California. If we can get, let's say, 20% of the workforce to telework every single day, like if one person teleworked one day a week, that would have huge benefits for us. Um, I think also outside of transportation, I've just seen people being a lot kinder to each other. You know, people are there to sidewalk drawings with chalk, with positive messages. People are putting teddy bears in their windows. You know, people are um, helping their neighbor with shopping, that kind of stuff. And so I think it's really made us understand that we all rely on each other and we're all in this together and I'm hoping that that's not lost after things start to go back to normal. <laughs> yeah, hopefully we can we can keep all some of the good things going on. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? I have tons of questions, but I don't want to make this kind of a uh, two person conversation when we have yeah. 40 people in the Thanks. in the chat. <laughs> Hi, Miguel. Uh, go ahead, Pizarra. Yes, thanks. Um, so Katrina's question inspired me to ask this question. So when you were working in Washington, D.C. at like the federal level Department of Transport, um, so I'm, I'm wondering what you, what, when, I'm sure you might have had different issues or different levels of concerns when working with stakeholders at the federal level, but also in the East Coast. Do you see a lot of differences, similarities once you started working in California, as in, uh, and as in like um is the issues quite similar or different values how do you compare your sort of daily work right now with what your experience in dc thanks yeah it's been really different um even the acronyms are different to be honest like i felt like you know i knew transportation i'd spent about a decade working in transportation and policy before coming out to california and i come here and like I don't know what anyone's talking about because all the acronyms are different. Uh -huh. And also when I was working at the federal level, we were always talking about federal legislation. And here, you know, we're talking about AB5 and SB1 and SB743 and all of these, these bills. And it's been so hard for me to get my head around because the names of these bills give no indication what they're about. Um, because they're all just, you know, SB, Senate bill with a number, AB, Assembly bill with a number. Those numbers are reused every single year. So you have to be like, okay, well, SB1 from 2017, not SB1 from a different year. Um, whereas on the federal level, sometimes the names of bills give you a hint uh, what they're about. Like, for example, the CARES Act, which was just passed, you know, to respond to coronavirus, might lead you to think that it's about caring for people or helping people. Um, but like AB5, I remember I was about two weeks into the job speaking on a panel and someone asked me about AB5 and I didn't know what that was. And now I do. Um, you know, it's the law that is um, regulating whether or not independent contractors are in fact employees of their um, employers. But I had no context to what that was and so I was kind of stumped. Um, the other thing that's a huge difference, at least right now, is um, I'm working under a Democratic administration. And when I was in DC most recently, I was working under a Republican administration. Um, and there are a big difference in uh, values and in prioritizing policies and projects. And um, 
the state of California, I believe, has 68, if that's right, lawsuits uh, against the federal government right now. It might be more than that, but I think that's what it was last time I checked. Um, so there are a lot of things that um, we don't necessarily agree on what's going on at the federal level. So it's kind of been interesting to navigate that. Um, and something else that's different is when I worked um, in DC, I was a career employee. I was nonpartisan. I, uh, I mean, politics did influence my work because I was working for, you know, a, a secretary from a political party. But as a, an individual employee, I did not engage in politics at the workplace at all. Whereas now, I am a political appointee under Governor Newsom, and so, um, you know, we certainly will use politics in terms of, you know, the governor wanting to see air quality going down, air, air not sorry, air, air emissions, um, we want air quality to go up, um, but emissions to go down. And, um, you know, we've had legislation supporting that, um, you know, looking at land use around transit stations, um, you know, the first partner is really interested in advancing women, um, which are all, I think, sort of different priorities than we're seeing at the federal level. And, and I have a chance to, to vocally support those things, whereas before, you know, I just went along with whatever, um, you know, was being communicated from up top. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's very interesting. I was also in uh, DC for like two and a half years. Sort of a follow-up question, if that's okay. Um, so I, I guess in California, but also in DC, um, generally in the transport sector, you have a, we have a lot of um, new players that are hoping to come into freight and transport, like tech companies who are doing, I, I guess, are they trying to reach out to the public policy space? Are they trying to reach out to you uh, at the federal level, at state level, because maybe they're expecting to play a bigger role in the future, or are they just trying to override um, state level uh, public policy people and just kind of do their thing? Thanks. Yeah. Um, I think the, the bigger, more established ones are certainly trying to reach out to us. Um, you know, we've had meetings with Tesla slash the Boring Company, with Via, um, with cruise automation, with Lyft. These are some meetings that I've been involved. And those are, you know, they've been around maybe a little bit longer than some of these new companies and are, are more established, but they realize that um, they need the state to understand what they do in order to, to have their products be allowed or advanced in, in policy decisions. Because um, we are essentially making the rules. And if we make the rules that aren't appealing to them or um, disclude them that that's not good for them. And so they are certainly reaching out to us and making sure that, you know, we understand what they're doing, what the benefits of their technologies are. Um, we had an offer to go on a tour of Elon Musk's tunnel in Los Angeles, which never happened, which would have been kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, they're certainly trying to make sure that we understand what's going on. And so we can, um, you know, support that or at least be informed when we're making policy decisions. Thank you, that's very interesting, thanks. Yeah. Carlos? Thank you, um, let me ask you something, maybe you don't know, but um, maybe. So do you have any clue, any idea about collaborative practices like companies working together or maybe companies working together with the government like currently happening in California in terms of uh, working together for reducing uh, emissions or reducing operative costs, any kind of collaboration between companies or between companies and the government? Um. I'm not aware specifically of like public private partnerships that might be going on in the state. I'm sure that there are, or that there is certainly coordination. Um, you know, something that does come to mind, our new head of the DMV is a man named Steve Gordon, and he came from the tech sector. He invented, um, I forget what, what the service is called, but it's, um, it's basically, it helps you find a better seat when you're flying. Um, and it's, yeah, some 
app or service that so he comes from the tech side and so he's trying to make um you know the dmv more tech savvy and maybe have more relationships with uh the private sector um but yeah i'm not aware specifically i'm sure there are examples i just unfortunately can't think of any right now of you know, specific collaboration between the state and um private entities but if i think of some i can follow up on that it's okay thank you Anyone else? Well, Kavital, thank you so much for all the great insights. And thank you for, for spending the, your Friday afternoon with us here. Great. Uh, if we have more questions, I'll, I'll forward them to you. Thanks again for your Wonderful. time and, and insights. My pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Hayer. Thank you, Anne Marie. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you for everyone for attending. Um, if you want to add me on LinkedIn, I would be happy to accept your request. You can feel free to send me a note there. Um, or if you want to send me an email, it's avital.barnea at calsta.ca.gov. I'll go back to my slide here so you can see how my name is spelled. So yeah, I'd be happy to hear from you. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank Have a nice you. weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you.